Hello, and a very warm welcome to episode 111, all the ones, of the Building Sustainability Podcast. I'm Jeffrey Hart, and every fortnight join me as I talk to designers, builders, makers, dreamers, and doers. Together, we can explore the wide world of sustainability in the built environment by talking to wonderful people who are doing excellent things. And today's wonderful person is Vanessa Champion, who is the editor of the Journal for Biophilic Design and the host of the podcast by the same name. There's a link to both of those in the show notes. This is the first of two episodes. It's another double episode. Uh, I seem to be having very long conversations these days. Uh, I hope you like the double episodes. I always struggle to work out whether I should be making them into one single episode and then putting loads on the patron. But it feels like there's so much good information that I don't want to put it behind a paywall. So anyway, you're getting a double episode. <laughs> Maybe let me know if you don't like them. Uh, what was I talking about? Oh, yes, today's episode. Um, we will be talking about all things biophilia and biophilic design. From underappreciated biophilic patterns, healthcare, benefits, and of course, materials. I always want to talk about materials. At the end of this conversation that you're about to hear, I felt so incredibly connected and part of something that I really believed in. And it really felt like it was all joined up. There was the architects working and the designers and the interior designers. It feels like everyone's got this brilliant common goal that I'm just a little part of. Yeah, I, I hope that you, um, you feel the same uh, when you've listened to it. Episode two will be out directly after this one. So um, do head straight on and listen to them both in one go if you've got the time. Uh, a bit of news before the episode. Uh, the ASBP Awards, the Alliance for Sustainable Building Products Awards for 2024. The shortlist has been announced and there are, as you'd expect, some fantastic buildings and really great products in there. Have a look at those. There's a link in the show notes. A uh, reminder of the free exhibition going on at the Design Museum in London at the moment. Uh, you can see full-scale models of wall sections made from beautiful natural materials. So definitely worth going and having a, a look and a touch of that. Um, personally, I'm about halfway through a retrofit project on the estate I live on. Uh, we are retrofitting the old granary with lovely natural materials, of course. Um, we're using stunning hemp bat insulation uh, that's gone into the ceiling and then that's being capped with some wood fiber board to catch all of those thermal bridges. The walls are getting a similar treatment. And then we'll be fitting a kitchen and creating a sleeping loft and giving the walls a coat of beautiful clay plaster. Mmm, delicious. Uh, what else to say? Oh, Nettlecombe Craft School. Always chatting about the craft school. We have a sale on. Uh, the competition ended. And now we have a sale on where you can save 10% on all courses. A day in the woods learning a new craft is the perfect Christmas gift. I'm sorry, I had to do it. Uh, and it really fits in with this episode. Um, the benefits of sitting in the woods, being surrounded by nature, are huge, as you'll hear. And you'll make something like a spoon from wood, from the woodland. And it'll give you a little biophilic boost when you're looking at it cooking your dinner it's an all-round incredible thing to do and 10 percent cheaper for the next two weeks so i hope to see you in the woods next year uh patrons one new supporter this week and that is clark taylor clark actually sent me a lovely message saying that they're off to learn straw bale building at yes tomorrow as the first step in changing career from chemist to natural builder and that this podcast has helped them on the way uh, that's such a fantastic email to receive. Thank you, Clark. I wish you all the best on your journey. And uh, yeah, check back in and let us know how it goes. Clark has supported at the higher level, which means they will receive a hand-carved wooden spoon for that biophilic response uh, coming your way soon. If you would like to be like Clark and support this podcast, and it is independently produced by me, then it would be so very gratefully received. You can do so at patreon.com forward slash building sustainability. There's a link in the show notes. And 
to say thanks, there is nearly 12 hours of bonus content on there. So yeah, do that if you can. Thanks. Uh, the final bits. Um, if this podcast tickles you, then make sure you check out episode 47 of the Building Sustainability Podcast. Uh, it's with Bill Browning and Katie Ryan from Terrapin Bright Green. Vanessa actually mentions them early on in this episode. It was nice that they got such a lovely mention and their work is is clearly so appreciated. Okay, that is it from me. I'm back at the end. Enjoy Vanessa Champion. <laughs> I'm um, editor and founder of the Journal of Biophilic Design, which is also a podcast series. Um, and we interview um, interior designers and architects, thought leaders, acousticians, researchers, academics, um, kind of a um, similar mix to your good self, uh, but probably maybe also focusing on um, more of the design side of things and how we can um, improve mm -hmm. the built environment um, for, for people, uh, planet, as well and um and obviously everybody has to think about this but also the prosperity and i mean that in in the widest sense of the the word not just um financial economy but also flourishing um so like professor derek clements croom if people don't know who he is I, I suggest them maybe they have a little bit of a google but he has this great thing called the flourish model where basically it's creating spaces and places where we we do that exactly uh, flourish. Yeah, he's um, he's done a great book called um, Designing Buildings for People, um, and he expands the uh, model in there. But um, there's also a load of other good examples and case studies and things in there. So that's also a good one to have. Yeah, but uh, but so personally, I I started off life as an academic, um, as a lecturer in Greek and Latin um, at University College London. Um, and but I was actually while I was specialised in epigraphy and languages, I was also really interested in the built environment in the ancient world, and how uh, civic design particularly um, improved and sort of like um, moulded uh, society to um, the positioning of various uh, buildings. And um, but then I was also was interested in. Uh, places called the Asclepian, which uh, Asclepius was the god of healing. And he had um, sanctuaries where people would go and relax and sleep. And often these places were out in nature. So they were nature sounds. Uh, and when I visited them, when I was in sort of the malleable age of about 20, I was like, oh my goodness, we should build all healthcare centers like this. And um, anyway, fast forward a gazillion years and uh, I'm thinking, well, you know, we've we've lost that and um, personal journey of my um, my mother being in hospital and my father having Alzheimer's looking at ceiling tiles. And I'm thinking there's got to be a better way to design um, healthcare. So that's why I started the podcast, really. So it combined the um, kind of the academic side of me because I wanted to find out. I didn't just want to take it for, you know, what's the, what is this biophilia effect? Because my mum looked at a picture of nature that I took in. I'm a, I'm a visual artist as well, so I'm um, sort of alongside everything else. I do photography and, and filming, um, particularly of nature. And um, and she started focusing, her blood pressure came down and um, her cortisol levels came down and um, a presto, she came back to me. But um, that was a, that was during the flu epidemic. And uh, although she was weaker when she came out, um, she was back. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's why I started the podcast series. And, and obviously now we're a we're a printed journal and we're on issue seven at the moment. The next one's coming out is uh, education. And um, we've had one on healthcare itself. And the NHS have written in that and the uh, workplace and cities and things. So, yeah, um, doing the right thing, I think. <laughs> it takes a long time, but it's just doing the right thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely doing the right thing. Um, it's really interesting um, that um, the healthcare example is it's sort of the the archetypal example, isn't it, of um, of the biophilia effect yeah um you know, the studies about about the healing effects in hospitals yeah roger ulrich uh did a study um in the 80s actually and you'd think we'd have picked up by it by now but uh he did a, a study of um patients looking at a view of nature and then obviously patients not looking at views of nature so looking at a wall and and looking at um other stuff and uh 
it was proven that um, they got better quicker and they needed less medical intervention. They were less sort of negative signs that the nurses um, witnessed and, and they basically got out of the hospital quicker. So there was a, it was like, it's a seminal study that was done. Um, and then after that, he went on and studied, you know, did more and more research um, to prove that views of nature and, and Terrapin Bright Green, so people who, who sort of like are interested in biophilic design, um, it's a good good place to start actually, Terrapin Bright Green's website. Um, that he's, and, and then most people who follow biophilic design follow his 14 or their 14 patterns um, of biophilic design. And the, and the best one really is the visual connection to nature. It's that direct connection that we see. So views of nature, obviously real plants and stuff. But um, yeah, so yeah, healthcare, healthcare started... Um, Sort of well, yeah, it was kind of one of the the early things, anyway, of of proving that the biophilic effect really improved our our well being. Mm-hmm. Do Do you know when you became aware of the term sort of biophilic design and biophilia? Yeah, I was. Um, so I said I was a visual artist, and I was selling um, my images um, to um, to to businesses, to uh, offices, and things. Um, I was printed on printing on a, acoustic panels so that boardrooms weren't boring. Um, but also, I had lovely views of nature so that people had like you know a window in spaces where there wasn't a window. Um, so I, I went along actually to a um, it's rocker, which is a um, f- a, a bathroom tiling company and they do beautiful bathrooms and sinks and all that kind of stuff but they're in a, a Zaha a hooded building near Imperial Wharf and uh, they did a, a seminar basically on by well they're doing it on e- e- you know environmental and sustainability um, in design and the guy who was doing it um, mentioned biophilia and because as I said I was sort of see you know I was a real Latin and Greek language nerd so when I heard biophilia I'm like oh biophilia I know what that means bio meaning life and philia meaning love it's like living loving life stuff um so I'd, I'd found about it there and then when I realized actually about it how it helped us flourish it kind of made made sense um I mean personally I'd been living naturally f- since I was about 15 um when I say living naturally that makes me sound like I was sort of running around naked but I don't mean that I mean <laughs> that um I was um just so eating naturally um using natural materials not wearing nylon not wearing polyester you know really not eating ping meals either I mean not that my mum was a kind of like good cook and stuff but do you know what I mean I kind of really was conscious I made conscious decisions every time I spent um you know stayed anywhere it, you know it had to have like this kind of natural connection so anyway when I heard the term I was like oh this is something um and then because as I said when my mum was sick and my dad was um he spent his last days he had I said he had Alzheimer's and vascular dementia and he was looking at ceiling tiles and I'm thinking that's not doesn't make sense you know while the um external you know the environment um what well, around him was kind of okay and looked like a home you know looked like a house I mean you know kind of that homely kind of effect you know, it was, it was looking at ceiling tiles and I'm thinking, well, how many more people are spending their last days looking at ceiling tiles? And especially with like, you know, vascular dementia um, and, and Alzheimer's where your frame of reference is so small. I mean, that must have been horrendous. It must have been like torture. Um, and it moved me so much to really. And then as I said, when my in the same time and, you, you know, you couldn't make that up. But when at the same time, when my mother was in hospital and she was looking at a pin board and a dustbin and a clock. And she was going nuts. I'm thinking, do you know what? There's there's these two situations at exactly the same time, which could be improved by this biophilia effect. Um, so yeah, so it was it was from that really. Um, it was kind of a whole bunch of things that, that sort of led to that. But um, yeah, um, I've always known that obviously nature connection is important. But um, yeah, the biophilic and bi- biophilia and biophilic design was the first was where I first found out about it. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I was very much the same in that um, finding out the term biophilia and biophilic design just kind of made sense of what I was already doing um, and the way I was living life and the way I was building my my buildings. Um, yeah, so then to find out that there was this this stack of research behind it uh, that's that was sort of saying that we all, what we all already kind of could feel. Um, it was really, you know, it, it great to know that you are actually on the right track already. Absolutely. And you, you use the word feel. Um, and that's really important, I think, because 
Um, a biophilic design is actually probably the most evidence-based design principle. Um, but ultimately, it's that feeling. And that's exactly it. And it's like we've forgotten. We've forgotten that we're part of nature, that we are nature, that it's inherent in us, that we're dependent, we're interdependent on nature. You know, without nature, we don't have water, we don't have food, we don't have shelter, we don't have any of that. Um, but And yet we're still, you know, building, constructing, consuming, um, as like it's like a, an, you know, an infinite source. And obviously we know it's not... Um, and uh, it's just it's just nuts. And that's another thing for me. So biophilic design isn't just about well-being for us. It's also about the well-being of our planet, because by its nature, um, you know, it's, it's you use you have to use sustainable materials. You have to well, you, you know, you have to use more environmentally friendly materials. And obviously, then you make the sustainable choice about where you source your wood from and all that kind of thing. So there is a there's a sort of a differentiation, which obviously, you know about. Um, but um, I think um, what you mentioned about that feeling is actually, so the whole thing with biophilia is actually about creating those places where our stress levels come down, we can work better, we can focus better, you know, we can add up better, we're more creative. Um, well, obviously, we know there's like a whole stress um, epidemic um, that's been going on really since just before, you know, we know obviously before COVID, but it really kind of ramped up but just, you know, just before COVID and, and obviously then during COVID and then since. Um, but stress is such a major thing. And, and we also we know that by designing workplaces and healthcare units and, and everything else in as a, as in forms of factories, you know, long, long open plan desks where there's loads of noise. You know, we just don't we don't focus. We can't we can't um, be the best that we that we can be. So, um, again, it's just going back to that word feeling because it's that's really a key point. Um, it's about creating spaces that feel good. I mean, we can maybe talk about sensory design, but, you know, how we feel, how we see, we touch, we smell, this whole sensory design thing, which biophilic design is all wound up in. It's about creating those spaces where we we feel good, we feel happy, we feel content. And um, yeah, and, and uh, you know, our blood pressure's down and, and yeah, we can, yeah, we can be the best versions of ourselves, really. Brilliant. Shall we chat a little bit about uh, biophilia? So you mentioned Bill and Katie's work at uh, Terrapin Bright Green. There's the, the patterns of biophilic design. Um, do you want to, to maybe, yeah. I wondered uh, if you wanted to give a few sort of examples, maybe yeah. sort of some easy ones that people can can kind of uh replicate and then also i was thinking you know what about the 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 sort of really beneficial often missed ones yeah absolutely absolutely um as you mentioned there's 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 14 patterns um um as, as i said you can go to the therapy and bright green website and um and actually download it for free which is a lovely gift for everybody um the, uh, I suppose the most important, there are five, for me, there are five most important ones um, that have the, the sort of greatest effect. And um, and actually on, I think it's um, sort of um, early on in the um, 14 patterns download, it has like different stress reductions and cognitive performance and uh, emotion and, and sort of, um, you know, blood pressure um, uh, levelling of each of these things from all based on evidence. All, this is all evidence based. But the first one, which is obvious, really, I suppose, is this visual connection with nature. So that's that's views of nature. That's having real plants around you. That's the the beautiful, you know, awe inspiring uh, views that we we have. Um, <clears throat> so that could be like, um, well, if you're in your workplace, literally bringing in um, living wool, for instance, or, you know, lovely um, broadleaf plants around you. Um, obviously, it cleans, clears air as well, which we'll talk about in a second. But um, if you don't have a window, if you, if you have a window into nature, so if you're in a, if you're in your home office or like I have here, I have a, I have a sort of very long door, and it it affords me a, a beautiful view of um, the squirrels playing and the birds, and so I have lots of activity. But then I have seasonal change out of the window. I see the cherry trees. I see all the flowers. I see the you know the daffodils coming up in the in the spring, and and then the you know there's all the just it's just beautiful. You see seasonal changes, so we know that that's really good for us because um, it lowers our blood pressure and our heart rate, 
um, and obviously improves our um, cognitive and our sort of mental state as well, so we can focus better. The second one is the is the sort of non visual connection with nature, but again, it's direct connection to nature. So so there's everything that um, isn't visual. So that's um, auditory, that's just things you can hear, that's things you can touch, smell and taste. Uh, obviously, we know that brings your blood pressure down and it, um, it sort of releases your, um, you know, obviously reduces your cortisol levels. But that's things like, uh, so you can introduce birdsong, waterfalls, uh, just rustling of leaves, uh, but it has to be real. So it's not like, um, you know, just uh, like uh, piano sounds or something like that. It's actually real, real direct connection to nature. The smell, so you can bring in like pots of lavender, um, rosemary, um, you know, they, all those things and um, things you can touch. So like natural materials, linen, cotton, wood, um, that's that's all really good for us. And also uh, things you can taste too. So think about um, maybe positioning um, herbs and things around by, by the kitchen area if you're designing workplaces. So it's creating this real connection, this direct connection to nature so that's really the second one. Um, so then there's the, there's the other, um, just the other three things, which I mentioned briefly then. So the other three things are thermal um, airflow, thermal and airflow variability. So that's actually changing temperature within a building or within a space. So that's like how it would be in nature. So if you think about an ordinary workplace, often the, the heat level is the same. Um, in hospitals, it's most definitely the same. Um, but it's about mimicking what happens in nature so it gets cold then it gets soft and you know it gets sorry it gets cold then it gets hot there's um natural breeze coming through then there's no breeze then there's a bit of a breeze and then also the the quality of the air changes so when it's raining it gets damp so it's about creating um that which is one of the best ways of doing that is having an open window which doesn't cost anything <laughs> uh, but it's actually open the window um so uh yeah and obviously that's another reason why we if we can create um beautiful biophilic spaces in cities where there's more natural trees it means the air quality that you're letting in would be better as well so it's a bit of a you know um joined up kind of approach but um, we, we do need that um the presence of water is really one of the most important things as well that's but we need to have the view of nature so from an environmental psychology point of view we also know that if we just hear water we think there's a leak <laughs> um but if there's if we hear and see water then it's a it's a real positive effect on us um so if you can put in a water feature it can be very simple you know just a little fountain um it can be actually when you come into a workplace i'm talking about workplaces like because i think i don't know most people listen to your podcast might be working in workplaces or building in public spaces um but also obviously in your house or your home in your home office or you know even in like your lounge or your um, space where everybody gathers together to create these um, little sort of interventions, really, where it just keeps reminding us that, oh, we're connected to nature. If you look around a space and there is no connection to nature, there's nothing that reminds of of, of the outdoor, work, like, you know, outdoor space, then that's when you need to really, really think about where your interventions are going to be. Um, and really the last one is prospect. And it's probably my favourite one, really, I suppose. And that's this is sort of what we call prospect and refuge. Um, well, there's, there's two different ones. There's prospect and refuge. But this prospect is about looking out. It's about having your um, having this beautiful view um, of, of nature. So um, creating spaces where you can sit and take time. And look out. Um, if you're if you're designing workplaces, it's creating office desks, say for instance, that that may look out even out onto the city or something. But it's about having those sort of wide, open views, um, which really inspire us. But actually, if you bring that even back to um, a sort of smaller kind of concept, and I'm just 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 to even use just to use the office example, if you create um, an area like with some tables. Um, with with obviously like they're back, but you know, back against the wall kind of thing, and then you're looking out, and you can see like the whole office, um, as well. We know that's really good for us because um, it helps our blood pressure come down and all this sort of thing. But it also um, it reduces fatigue and irritation because we have this thing called attention restoration theory, which is that every like you know people talking about micro breaks because we're focused so much on one thing, but actually if we look up every now and again. It helps our brains um, just kind of come back down. Um, 
I've actually, so I'm just off on a bit of a tangent, but I've I've been studying uh, how our brains work, you know, sort of beta and alpha waves, because uh, because obviously all this is all based on research, and I'm I just want to know why. <laughs> but um, obviously, alpha waves is where we're in like a meditative or kind of calm state when we're in nature, and um, you know we might be chanting or whatever else it is, but you know even if we're just in in nature, it's it sort of it's good for our brains. This alpha state, beta state is where we're like really doing really um, lots of concentration. We might be doing a spreadsheet. We might be doing lots and lots of, um, uh, if we're doing, des- you know, like really intense design, you know, calculations and things. We need that, those moments of, um, so we say this sort of, a, to, to restore your attention. So attention restoration, it's about restoring yourself to a little, you know, take, taking you back to this sort of alpha state, however quickly it might be, you know, um, and um yeah, so the so the prospect thing is really good because it actually affords you that those moments of uh, relief. Um, so looking out, obviously, if you can look out onto plants, that we know that's even better for us. But the to to go going alongside the prospect, there's uh, there's refuge, um, and um, that um, is the thing of because because our physiology. So the whole sort of biophilic concept, this sort of concept of biophilia, is that we're you know physically and biologically the same as we were when we were living lives on the plains you know 100,000 years ago we were we're still the same beings we're still the same animals if you want um and when you know when we were exposed you know walking through and then there was the saber-toothed tiger that would jump out it's like we don't have our back against the wall we need to retreat and go and have you know know we're safe because um, our cortisol levels are up all the time, our backs are exposed, and, and it's the same kind of mindset that we feel because our bodies are still like we might hear loads of noise around us and things, and um, we're still expecting to be attacked. We're still we're so we've got this fight or flight thing. You know, people have heard of this fight or flight and our adrenaline. You know, very very often, you know, we uh, most of our work a day is 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 high you know our cortisol levels and, and our stress levels are high because there's loads of noise there's loads of people around us and we don't we haven't engineered these prospects and refuge spaces in so it's about creating little nooks like like the nook pod things um where people can go and and sort of you know tuck themselves away and but still look out so still be part of something um there's a lady called harriet dr harriet short who talks about alone together and um and that sort of feeds into this. It's about, and also if you know people who are sort of neurodiverse, and and I think all of us at some stage, you know, in our in our day where we want to just be away from everybody, we just need to focus. We need to just take some time. So these prospect and refuge for me, I think is probably my one of my um, I'll say favorite, but I think it's one of the most important um, elements of of design of this biophilic design concept. Um, uh, you know, over and above, obviously, the direct connection to nature. But if there's one that, you know, anyone takes away, it's about creating these spaces for people to huddle in. Um, because, you know, to go back to the auditory thing, but we know that that if it's very noisy in our environment, again, our blood pressure go, goes up, we can't focus. So it's giving our bodies um, rest, time for rest. Um, so yeah, so prospect and refuge is is one of those those key ones. Brilliant! I like that the um, the alone together. Um, I just saw uh, a post somewhere that was saying um, about uh, someone that goes to a it's a silent reading book club where they have half an hour where they sort of go and everyone meets in a big room and they have a chat and then everyone sits and reads their own book silently yeah. for for an hour. Uh, and that's that's their sort of their evening. So they're you know doing a very solo task uh, of reading, but but in a very communal sense. Mm. I felt that was wonderful. Yeah, I love that. I think that's like a, it's almost like a, like a retreat, isn't it? Or like a you know you go to when you go to a Buddhist um, temple, for instance, and you go there you know on the on the Sunday and they you know they do the chanting, but then you have this quiet time where everybody's in the room together and you can just be or if you're in a church you have these times where obviously though then it's often led by somebody but I, I love the fact that you can all be you know there's this kind of it's something I, I do work um in Africa so I've I've, I've traveled with uh, nomadic tribes in uh, in Uganda and and there is this sort of beauty when I when I 
it's funny this there's this whole thing about quietness i'm i'm fascinated by that as well i'm very fascinated by sound um but the whole uh thing of being quiet we've forgotten how to do that we seem to be always wanting to be on we're wanting to be watching you know videos we're wanting to be watching scrolling through instagram and we don't have these quiet moments we don't have this restoration for ourselves you know we're I don't know, we're sort of nuts, isn't it, really? It's, it's bonkers. But um, by, by, you know, designing these spaces in and then um, encouraging people to to be together um, and be quiet as well is a really good idea. And I love that idea, um, Silent Reading Book Club. Um, what a cool, cool concept. Lovely. I was interested in, I mean, we started talking a little bit at the beginning about healthcare. Um, how, how do you think, well, what I was thinking about healthcare is obviously, you know, it feels like healthcare and say schools are probably uh, some of the most important or more important places that we should be applying these principles. Um, but the healthcare one especially has has kind of difficulties, like my friends currently in, um, or just got out of hospital, um, you know, they, they took flowers off of him because of uh there's people with allergies and, yeah. and things like that so there's very and, and sort of you know if there's lots of plants that they maybe need to be cleaned because they might collect dust or uh it seems like there's lots of barriers to to what we might initially think of as as sort of design solutions so are there are there other sort of well-suited yeah. ways for for healthcare yeah um as uh, i mean yeah exactly i've you can see the thing is while you can't put plants in the wards you can put them in um other areas in the work in the uh in healthcare so that's also a thing um we're sort of having discussions with people in the nhs you can put it in you know certain reception areas and also in the um staff breakout areas you know people forget that um uh healthcare places are also um workplaces so it's also not having it's also about edu- it's an education piece as well, isn't it? It's about understanding that you know, while whoever it is that's said in the first place that we can't have plants in the um, in the wards themselves or in in those spaces, I understand it in an ICU unit or whatever. But um, but that you can put it in other places, which will have a you know really 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 positive effect, um, reducing stress, but also making families are more comfortable and um you know having that whole initial um approach into the hospital a better one so having trees and planting and gardens i mean horatio's garden concept is brilliant that you see in hospitals where um it's for you know particularly for children but other obviously other people can go in often um to most of these but you can go in and and it's um it's, it's a garden so you can go and you can sit and um, they have places as well where if people are in there long term but are mobile, um, they can go and do some gardening. Um, there's there's one here in Hertfordshire um, where um, people can go and um, and actually do a bit of gardening, which is fantastic. So, um, but there's other things like um, just sit, like, even like circadian lighting. So you can adjust the lighting so it does change during the day. You can create um, better soundscaping. Um, actually in the wards and so if we're talking about in the wards where people can't can't view um, can't have real plants around them um, so you can create better soundscaping um, you can put bird song or, or soundscape you can encourage people to choose the sound they want and localize it um, I mean there's enough tech that's cheap enough really for people to um, to do that or even to encourage people if they have their own um you know, iPods and things like that to encourage them to look at nature or to do a streaming thing or, you know, to do a communal streaming of of like some, you know, woodland or whatever. I was working with an AV company um, that produced these tellies that are wheelable and that means people can have like a face to face with their consultant in a, in a, um, you know, remotely while they're in hospital. So if the, if the consultant can't get to them uh, for whatever reason, they can do an, a one-to-one with them. But when that telly's not being used, when that interface isn't being used, they can swap that for a view of nature, which they could then select as a, you know, maybe they're like a really, you know, blue mine, sea, ocean nut. They can just watch some sea, you know, watch some waves. Or, you know, if they love the trees, they could, you know, switch it to that um, and combine it with like a nature scape or nature sounds or, you know, piano music or whatever else they want with it. Um, 
But the lighting is really important. Um, a lot of these places, they have the same lighting that's sustained the whole time. And when my mum was passing away, I mean, obviously I said that, you know, beforehand that during the flu epidemic she was in, but um, she got sick again um, and she was she, actually, she passed away in, in February this year. But um, when she spent her last days, um, there was so much cacophony and the lighting was the same. And it was only near the end where they realised that they could dim the light. Honestly, I, I I can't even begin. To, sorry, you can probably hear my the anger in my voice there. But you, I, I just you know this that should not happen. <laughs> that should not happen. Um, but you know, creating proper circadian rhythm lighting for the staff as well, which would help you know reduce stress, improve the mood, and um, also the cognitive performance of the staff because otherwise they're on all the time. They know those lights where they are, so it's all the same. Um, but, it's, you know, it's actually creating views of nature. Um, that's really the most important thing, as I mentioned right at the beginning. And this is obviously where all this has come from for me, because I took in the pictures of nature, which I now also install into the NHS. And, um, you know, like uh, people who are having sort of cancer treatment where they're sitting there for, you know, for hours um, and they're just staring at a white wall and, and curtains or just, you know, horrible chairs which are all mismatched because the design is awful there's no even no earth tones in the colorways i mean that that could be done it's not that's not rocket science um but the, you know these views of so the views that i i put in they're they're actually printed on this metal um which is fire retardant um the chemicals that are at, also the sorry the polymers of the inks are actually fused with the polymers of the metal so it means they can clean it but uh, because i don't print the white it looks 3d so as people even if they're absolutely supine and they can hardly move if they just you know if even a slightly movement of people around them it looks like the trees are alive and um that's the analog it can go on the wall there is no excuse so if they moving you know as i you know having views of nature is really really important if you can't move the beds to a view of nature and obviously if the beds the views of nature or the views out of the window are just other brick walls um, or car parks, which often these places are, then, you know, it's not, it's, put, a, put a picture of nature on the wall. <laughs> you know, what, what, I don't understand what's the, yeah, I don't understand what the, what's the matter with these designers and these people. Um, and, the, you know, it's like they wouldn't want to be in a hospital where they're just looking at a wall. You know, they'll probably go, because the people who are in charge of this will probably be able to afford to go into like a private healthcare facility. This should be for everybody. This should so be for everybody, these views of nature. But it should be in the wards where people are getting, where we are recovering, are having treatment. It should not just be in the places where, you know, it's just thoroughfares and, you know, they stick artwork on the walls and things. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's great. We've ticked the box. But it's not. This should, this should be in places where people where people are healing. We should create heal places of healing. We should actually do that, places of healing, you know, so... I don't yeah. know if this answered your question, so I've gone off on oh, a bit no, of Oh, no, very much. <laughs> oh, emotional about it. Well, yes, I could mm. I could definitely hear the, the passion um, that you have for that, that topic, and I, I wholeheartedly agree. Mm. It's the place where we should have the most healing in all senses. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, as I say, my friend was in hospital recently, and, and the photos he was sending of just, just horrible plastic, yeah, that kind of uh, ye slightly yellowed yeah. white plastic is... Ugh. it's not right it's not right and i i did a, a brilliant interview with um uh dr Leighton phillips he's um part of nhs wales um he's in the sort of southwest of wales and um and he's kind of like sort of director of innovation down there and he's introducing biophilic design and the way he's doing it he's getting his staff involved so they understand it so they get it and they advocate it and they can experience it and realise how different it, it, you know, it's making, um, it can make. Um, so when I, I, at the end of the sort of podcast I did with him, I said, look, you know, how are we going to get this into the NHS? You know, obviously putting all the weight on his shoulders. I said, how are we going to, how are we going to get this into the NHS? What do we, what do we, um, what do we need to do? And he said that, and I've taken this for so many other, I, you know, um, uh, workplace kind of concepts as well but every time we buy we have a choice we can either buy what we normally do or we can buy better we have a choice we can choose to buy better we can choose to do better we can choose to to be better 
And um, and I think that's the same for everything, really. I mean, you know, whether it's ethical building, sustainable building, eco building, um, create, you know, which materials are you going to use? Where are you going to source them from? Are you going to source them from a massive conglomerate, which is um, exploiting people on the other side of the planet? Or are you going to go maybe local? You know, while you think it might cost you more, actually, it probably wouldn't. Um, and it definitely wouldn't be costing the earth more. And you'll be sustaining a smaller business and all this stuff. And it means as well you can build a relationship and um, yeah, it's just it's about buying better, isn't it? It's about every time we buy something, it's like, you know, buying something with a fair trade label on, but in, in all sense of the words, you know, so yeah, but anyway, that was that was his kind of solution to it. And I think that's, that's so important. And, and if we're designing these healthcare spaces, it's the reason I'm doing this really is it's because I just want a whole joined up approach because you have the designers are here, you have the facility managers, which are over there, you have the um, you know the the guys with all the women whoever it is with with the purse strings over there. And then you have the bean counters above them, and then you have and then there's the construction people, and it's like oh for goodness sake, when you all talk to each other, you know, <laughs> it's <laughs> yes, sort of, absolutely, isn't it? It's like a playground, isn't it? It's like a playground for everything. Even in the, even if you're designing an office building, it's like everybody's like off on an off on one. They're all doing their own thing, and it's when you when you see, and I think this is what I'm really I'm taking heart to actually to to, uh, to use your name, but um I'm I just really because people are um. There are there's more people coming together. There are more people who live and breathe and feel, um, you know, sustainable ethical design. And I mean ethical in every in, again in every sense of the word for people and planet and everything. But they're coming together because and they're starting and they're working. You know, we're working together, and we're choosing who we work with. So, I mean, that's eventually. <laughs> We hope that we end up being more of us, and they will of the the conventional, um, conventional um, way of designing and building. Um, it has to be more roundtable, and also designing with the people in mind. You know, who's going to be using it? What was it going to be used for? How are they going to be feeling? What are they doing? What's what, what's the nature of their their job task? Are they going to be focusing on? Are they going to be concentrating? Are they going to be doing sales? You know, let's create zones. Let's create spaces for people to do the things so they can again flourish in what they do. Yeah, anyway, just sorry, I'm, I'm not, ram- rambling. Not, <laughs> no, that's good. You're here for a ramble. Um, uh, yeah, it's sort of that idea of um, not just creating containers for people to do a thing in, but actually creating a, a space for them to thrive in all senses. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you must do that, mustn't you? I mean, for what you do, you, your, your, the, the designs that you create, uh, Jeffrey, are. You, I mean, no way, like you say, that you know, no way would they be classed as containers. They're like, they're hugs. They're, they're <laughs> really physical hugs that you create that go around people who use the spaces. I mean, they're, they're, they're delightful. Oh, thank you very much. That's very kind. Yeah, no, you so think about what, where, you know, how you're going to design, the materials you're going to design, how are they going to, how is it going to, and going back to your words, how is it going to feel? How is that space going to feel? Um, yeah, I think, I think they're beautiful, Jeffrey. really do. Oh, thank you. It's it's interesting actually because um, so I'm in my house at the moment, which um, I very consciously, for sort of sustainability uh, reasons, made quite um, or very airtight. So there's no no sort of drafts uh, in terms of energy performance. No air is leaking out. You know, you don't get that cold kind of draft down the back of your neck when you sit on the sofa. What I'm realizing, <laughs> I spent the weekend at my my partner's who lives in a little cabin, and you know the the window was open and the breeze was rolling in, and just how much more alive I felt in that space than in my space. Mm. And so I think I'm going to have to slightly change mm. the way I use my own house to kind of I don't know it's a it's a <laughs> difficult balance, isn't it? Because there's mental well being, but there's also you know, I don't want to be using lots of energy, um, again, for sort of for the planet, for the well-being. There's just, there's, it feels like there's these sort yeah. of points where there's no, there's no perfect solution, is there? It's, it's, it's finding that balance. Yeah, it is. It is most definitely. And, um, you know, I mean, if, if in your space you've, you've, you know, you've created it so that it absolutely seals. I mean, if you do have, you know, if you've obviously got a door to get in, so just, you know, just knock that door open every now and again to just change the air because it's so important for you. Uh, and also, I mean, obviously it sounds like where you are, you've seen, I mean, you've, you've got an amazing 
sound coming from this this podcast. So you've obviously it's, it's completely it's just got very acoustically um, brilliant, actually. But um, if you're you know if you're going if if people yeah, but if people are designing for workplaces, I did a, an interview with. Um, Paige Hodsman and she says so she's an acoustician she's a psycho acoustician so she doesn't mean she's sort of like you know goes there and are you there she's <laughs> already been like it's not psychic but psycho <laughs> she looks at um how the um audible traits um actually affect our brain how it actually the actual you know affects the the neurons in our in our brains and um and she was saying that you know the cacophony in the workplace is so bad and obviously you can put acoustic panels on there you can put soft furnishings all this stuff which we know we need to do rather than all these blasted plastic covered tables with plastic chairs and metal bits and bobs everywhere where everything is reflecting things backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards um and all those horrible white ceiling tiles that never sit properly and they they sort of start going manky colors and, and all this sort of stuff i know there's a lot better now but you know, generally, a lot of office places are really manky. She said to me that one of the best things you can do for improving acoustics in a space is to open the window. So if it's really, really bad, so I'm not talking about spaces where it's all closed in or closed closed and, and sort of quiet, but actually, if you're in a cacophonous office, so um, it's to open the window, it's to open the door, because it lets the sound waves out. Because if you think a sound wave is actually... It's going, you know, it's, it's, it's a wave like a ripple on the water. And they, they keep going on and on and on and on. I remember learning about that when I was about seven and thinking, oh, my goodness. Imagine all the telly noise and the people noise. And because it goes out and out and out and out into space, I was told when I was a kid. That I'm like, I think, oh, my God, the space must be so noisy. <laughs> so I suppose it is, really. But anyway, that's another tangent. Um, but, yeah, so open the window. Open the window, Jeffrey, because yeah. it's, really, it's really good for you. Because also it um, improves the thermal and airflow variability which is what I mentioned before, which is one of the, the really great patterns of, um, of biophilic design is creating the airflow because then it's a different temperature for you as well. So um, yeah. that's, so you flourish in that space. So yeah, open, open the door. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, we've sort of segued nicely onto uh, materials there. And that was a thing I'd like to ask you about yeah. in terms of you know, maybe uh, we get a lot of uh, architects, uh, people that are renovating their homes, um, a lot of people that probably just work in an office, but uh, thinking about the materials that they could finish their space with, um, what what sort of suggestions mm. might you have? Oh, gosh, yes. So cotton, linen, <laughs> um, wool, uh, you know, wood. Um, yeah, just natural materials. Um, I've... Um, I've just come back actually from the dreaming in Wales and um, it's the epitome of biophilic design interior. Oh, I've you know, never heard of that. What's that? Design. So um, I don't know if any of your listeners remember um, Charlotte Church. Uh, she was a singer. Um, she was kind of a sort of child prodigy. And uh, long story short, she's now re running a retreat centre in, um, in Wales. And... I went over to interview her actually for for the, for the Journal of Biophilic Design podcast and, and did a video interview with her, and um, and she's really interested in sound healing. But it's actually Laura Ashley's old house. So Laura Ashley's old house had, um, had sort of fallen a bit into disrepair, and um, obviously the, the, the Ashley family weren't there anymore, and it had gone. It'd been sold to someone else, and she saw the land and fell in love with the land, and um, she then she couldn't believe it was up for sale, so she bought the place <laughs> and she said oh, how am I going to am I going to how am I going to do this but she's bought the place and she's now designed it with uh, Sarah of London um, another good person to look up actually uh, S E R A of London and she worked with um, sustainability advisor um, and biophilic design advisor Claire Bowman of R C Z M design I think it might be R C Z M architects um, if, if people don't know their work, I suggest you did have a quick look. But I know Claire and she told me about it. And, and Claire, Claire did a lot of the sourcing as well. And I have to say, uh, Jeffrey, that there were so many ideas in that space that was just perfect. So um, there was a reclaimed table, um, which had actually been sourced from... Um, this this sort of smaller company um, that just use wood that just use wood that's been re that's fallen, 
um, or you know just sitting there and, and they've they, they use that so they don't cut any more new you know don't cut any trees down it's it's really purely sustainable and they created these beautiful benches where we all sat down and while I think most of us who went who kind of I was on the retreat as well um, were like oh I, I like to do my own thing you know I kind of normally would sit in the corner on my own um, it forced us all to be together um, and that is another thing that biophilia is about it's about creating these spaces for people to be because biophilia is actually love of life and living systems and that means us too so it's not about it's you know combating loneliness as well but it's actually about we're social creatures so it's making sure that we also support each other and have spaces where we can connect um, even if we are like we just said alone together um yeah but that was really beautiful the other sort of materials there was like a cob like you do and the sort of cob walls um kind of constructions uh and sort of earthen um you know earthen plaster around the walls and there was exposed brick these there were these rattan um hand woven lampshades which you have to see they're like these beautiful they're like lanterns but because they're all um the same material going all the way through the spaces um all the different rooms and the corridors the light comes through these um excuse me they cut they, they all, the light goes through all of you know through the the little holes in these sort of crocheted lights and cast these beautiful patterns on the walls so it's like sort of like dispersed sunlight as you walk through but the light the light fittings as well the light bulbs are not bright you know if we're creating homes you know obviously this is a home space but you know it was just it's like how do you want your home to be do you want it to be like a bright you know sort of neon infested kind of space or do you want it to be like a nurturing home and loving space for loving for yourself as well as anybody who might enter it, including your pets, you know, kind of these little warm, you know, havens for people to come to. So light bulb colours are really important, these warm spaces. Um, there was a silk lights as well, which had been done. So again, using natural um, natural materials. Um, so rather than using nylon, which it, cause I thought they were tights, first of all, when I saw them. <laughs> They've been kind of like... Um, ex- <laughs> expanded around a kind of light um old light um shade thing so we're using old light shade so it was obviously reclaim it was a lot of reclamation there but they put these beautiful silk things which were then hand painted like these beautiful designs so if you want to kind of think like how saris or dana with like hand painted sort of shapes and dots and lines um but it gave it a really organic um natural feel because it was done by hand and not by machine so it wasn't like a printed design it was all done by hand so that's really important so it's creating these kind of um using materials then and finishes that um that are real that it connect us to life and living things and living people and each other um yeah and and obviously lots of like just natural oh and, oh, and also the curtains which were linen and, and have actually been repurposed so some of them were really old they have done loads of sourcing to find these like really long panels linen and cotton panels which um if you think about in in sort of like the 40s it was kind of all the rage um or before and slightly before that but they've they, you know these things are still in existence or even to create them new but what they did was they dyed them with tea so I used to do this and I, I do it for like outside and, you know, when you, when you use cotton and you want a kind of like more natural colour, I put a load of tea bags, the old tea bags and I um, dye material um, with tea. So you get these lovely earth colours and um, yeah, so these, these beautiful hangings and the curtains at the window were just, it was all this earth tones. It was lovely. Yeah. So um, yeah. But anyway, just that's, that's another, another kind of idea is to use um, natural dyes as well. Um you know, and it's, it's great as well if you can, if you're creating your own home, to do it with your family. Yeah, do it with your family, do it with your kids. Um, it's, you know, it creates a nice little sociable thing that you can then nurture. And, and um, it's just a talking point as well, people come around for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny, actually, I have had forgotten, but um, I actually received an email from Charlotte Church when she was starting that project saying that she'd like to work with me. Really? And I sent her an email straight back saying, hello, Charlotte. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm sure it probably wasn't from Charlotte, but um, saying, yes, I'd love to work with you. And then yeah. I never heard from her again. So uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's good to hear that she's um, she's done a, a wonderful thing without me. I was going to say maybe just a different bunch of people came on. But um, yeah, I'll, you'll have to. Uh, well, she's, she's going to actually build some more places. So maybe I'll mention you. <laughs> I will, well, maybe I will mention yeah. you again. <laughs> Please do. <laughs>
Oh my goodness, thank you, Vanessa. That is part one of two parts. So make sure you head on into the next episode. We talk more about materials. We talk about example projects as some of the most beautiful projects. We talk about biophilic design and sustainability. We talk about interior landscapers. I ask, is this a trend? We also talk about the Journal for Biophilic Design and all the great stuff that's found in that. There are links in the show notes. Uh, there's a link to the book Designing Buildings for People, Sustainable Livable Architecture. That is with Hive, who give money to your local independent bookshop every time you buy. They also give me a little bit of money if you click on the link. And just if anyone is thinking that I'm just creaming in the money, uh, I think I have nearly made the threshold of £20 that they pay out on in eight months of, of putting all the Hive links on. So, uh, yeah. It pays for maybe my coffee. I've also put a link to Terrapin Bright Green, uh, the patterns. Uh, also put a link to the podcast with Bill and Katie and Horatio's Garden. I've been reflecting on that, the making my house airtight uh, and not having a breeze and changes in temperature. I think the changes in temperature is really interesting because it, it kind of goes hand in hand with a log burner and the way that I'll have the log burner on for a bit and when I get back it's cold and so there's a real, you know, you heat up the space and then it slowly dissipates so you've got that changing temperature all the time. But again, it's sort of tempered with this knowledge that wood burners are actually pretty bad for local pollution uh, in terms of what's actually coming into my house. So every time I open the door I get a, a little cloud of particulate matter coming in. Um, but also what I'm giving to my neighbours. So... Oh, goodness. It's it's complex, isn't it? Trying to do the right thing. I also realised that my MVHR, which I love because of what it does for giving me fresh air, but, but without losing the heat that I put into the house, it does a really good job of regulating the humidity. So actually, internally, my the sort of humidity level doesn't fluctuate that much. And so that's interesting to, to know that that's actually potentially not as helpful. And I have gone down this thought path before i kind of reasoned that i built myself a tiny little house because i really like spending time outside i spend a lot of time outside my workshops outside actually i'm probably getting a huge boost from doing all of those things uh you know walking to do my laundry is not in my house too small uh you know, I think because I don't really spend a huge amount of time actually in my house, then I'm getting those boosts from elsewhere. And therefore, it's OK for it to be a bit more airtight and a bit more regulated. I mean, it's also full of cork. I was thinking about that refuge point and my my mezzanine sleeping loft. I deliberately kept the walls cork coloured. The, the sort of dark cork that uh, Matt was talking about in the last episode uh, on the cork house. I wanted to keep it dark so that it was, it sort of had a, a snug, warm, cosy feeling to it. And there's been a few times where I've retreated up to my, my bedroom and just sort of felt quite soothed by this space. Um, obviously, you know, I've got trees in it. I've got lots of wood grain. I've got natural colours um, <laughs> I did as much as I could to make it a biophilic experience. So yeah, what am I saying? I think I'm saying I can deal with having quite an energy efficient house, uh, because it gives to me, uh, the biophilic stuff in other ways. Have I, mm, am I justifying that to myself or to you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Episode two. Get on it straight away. I will see you there. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I hope you're doing really well. See you soon.